Well, I'd like, I'd like to talk a little about how I got involved in field research. And I got involved as a graduate student in Sydney. I was taking a course in education and I was particularly interested in adolescent development or child development and within that adolescent development. And there was a, uh, an emphasis in the literature on adolescence about the, the importance of the adolescent peer group in socialization. Up to the adolescent stage, the family was seen as the most important group. And then in adolescence, there was a consensus amongst all the theoreticians and writers on, on adolescence that the peer group, the adolescent peer group, became the critical factor, taking over from the family and socialising the, um, the child. The only problem was that there was very little real data on how the peer group influenced the child, and it obviously did so dramatically. I mean, if you look at what happens in uh, adolescence, the, at the early end of ad adolescence, the adolescent uh, isn't associating with members of the opposite sex at all, if we take one critical dimension. He comes out the other end getting ready to get married or actually being married. So, and it was suggested that the adolescent peer group was the vital link in that change in attitude along with the hormones. But uh, it seemed that the hormones weren't enough because it was that primarily those kids who went through the adolescent peer groups who were the ones who mainly made that change and made it very dramatically and very clearly. In fact, and that represented about 80% of young people in uh, modern urban cultures. Now, it seemed that most of the evidence there was just anecdotal. No one had actually got into adolescent peer groups to see how they worked, uh, particularly out of school contexts. So I decided that what I'd like to do for a master's thesis was actually get out there in the field and study some of these groups at first hand and look at the dynamics, study them as small groups. There were not even the most elementary things seemed to be known about them. The various textbooks had conflicting evidence about how big these groups were. Just take one very sort of simple example. Some said that adolescents went around in crowds and others said they went around in cliques and others said they went around in, in gangs and so on. There's a lot of literature on delinquent gangs. So I talked to some of my uh, fellow graduate students and uh, to also to faculty and so on and said I wanted to do this general reaction was, well, you can't do this. How on earth would an adult get to wander around with teenage groups? Um, however, I decided this is where I'd set my heart, this is what I like to do, and so um, I set off to try and do it. My first attempt was a failure. I thought I wanted some representative sample, and it did so happen, happen that one of my professors had taken a, a, a sort of stratified random sample of adolescents in Sydney and had done a survey of them. I thought, well, this is a good place to start. I'll just uh, take a, a random subset from this group and I'll call up these adolescents and I'll arrange to come out and observe their groups. And I, in fact, did took this sample and I called the first adolescent and he told me no uncertain terms. He didn't have any friends. <laughs> and he seemed a bit embarrassed. And I was a bit embarrassed by the end of the conversation too. So I then called another adolescent and he said he had some friends but he didn't want to be bothered <laughs> by me <laughs> and so it went on after about half a dozen phone calls I was more embarrassed I think more embarrassed than the people I called and it seemed it was fairly clear that they were not very happy about me coming out wandering around with them so that was a dead end and I thought maybe my friends and and supervisor and so on were right that I probably couldn't do this I'm not quite sure now how it happened but somehow or other I think somebody suggested to me that maybe I could start with a teenage club but there were some clubs around Sydney and maybe as these were run by adults I could get access to those situations and then move out into the community from there. So this is, uh, this is what I began to do. So I had to locate clubs. So I located clubs around Sydney, called up the adults who were in charge of them. I used, I think, for mainly friends at first as, to get an introduction to some of the ones uh, that were around. They were mainly church groups, I remember, at first. And then uh, and I got into one club at first and I was introduced to the teenagers in that club and I found that indeed it was fairly easy to move into a club setting where there were both adults and teenagers involved. I was a bit worried about the representativeness of the group I was studying and so on but at this stage I was desperate to get in touch with any teenagers at all. I found indeed the crowd setting was a very good, uh, that, that club setting was a very good uh, way to make contact and that one could then naturally, say when uh, the formal procedures were over, wander out of the building with uh, some of the kids as they were walking out 
And almost automatically, they, as they got to know me, they would sort of say, oh, we're going on to what in Australia is called a milk bar or somewhere, uh, or we're going to hang over here on this street corner for a while, would you like to join us? Well, they'd just move over and just stand, stand around and, and I'd be with the group and so it would be natural to go on talking to people. So step by step, it would only take two or three weeks, I found that I was being drawn out into other activities that they were involved in or sitting uh, with them somewhere or going to, down to the, walking down to the beach with them or whatever. And so in fact it was possible from that setting, using that as a launching pad if you like, to get out into their regular, um, uh, regular act some of their regular activities. Not all of them, I, was, I soon became clear that they didn't want me involved with some of them. For example, I spent some time studying a delinquent gang. Uh, it was really a, a group of delinquent gangs. They called themselves rockers because that was the rock and roll age of the 50s. And uh, the, real, the real thing, rock and roll music was their thing. And um, that was an interesting story in a way because I'd come in there to a community group which had been set up to do some good for these youngsters uh, who were roaming the streets and getting in, uh, into delinquent activities and criminal activities and so on. And so I came into this club situation which has been set up by middle class people for these, um, to do good for these adolescents and I found uh, the businessmen arriving along with their suits and the teenage rockers with their of their uh, leather jackets and so on. And in the end, that, uh, that group uh, didn't work in the sense that the teenagers ended up tearing the club apart. Uh, they came back to do that after they'd left, but when they walked out one night, they just simply walked out leaving all the, teen uh, all the adult leaders behind. Um, and I thought, that's the end of this part of my study. I wandered out after them and they were standing around complaining about the broken promises that they felt uh, been made and, and broken by the adult leaders and I he sort of pulled a long face and said well you know I'm just this guy who's trying to write a book about teenagers and this makes it very difficult for me guys what am I what am I going to do I mean I've spent a few weeks getting to know you guys and so on now you've walked out of the club and they said oh that's all right you come down the wharf this is where they hung out in Sydney Harbour you come down the wharf we'll introduce you to our friends you're all right you're not like those sons of bitches from that uh, group back there and so I went, was invited at that stage to come down with them and they were looking for someone to talk to. I think one of the issues in field research is what can you exchange uh, with the people that you're working with in the field. And with a delinquent group for example I found that one of the things that I exchanged for them that they valued was acceptance by an adult. This was a group of kids who had dropped out of school, many of them. Uh, some had been asked to leave uh, by teachers. They had, in some cases, been thrown out of their homes by their parents. They had been taken away to, as they said, sent up the river by a judge. Uh, they had small periods in reform homes and so on. So their experience of adults was that adults were non-accepting of their way of life. Something I found I could give them was the feeling of being accepted by an adult. I, would, I was quite happy to sit there and listen to them talk about their school experiences or their experiences with the various other agencies of the community or with their parents. And not, I deliberately withheld judgment on their activities. And that kind of acceptance was something that they were searching for. So we, for, we in that particular case, for example, and I found this was true of most of the teenagers I, I dealt with, very often they were in some kind of rebellion against adults or felt that adults were judging their way of life. To have an adult who was sympathetic, who would listen, was a, a resource that they wanted. And so in exchange for being there and them giving me information, I was giving them the acceptance of an adult and the non-judgmental acceptance at that, which they seemed to value. And there were other things that I could offer. I had a car and for some of these younger teenagers they didn't have transport. So if they wanted to get somewhere, they were very happy to use me as a form of, form of transport and that was just no, another simple thing that I could exchange. Uh, and, and I guess I had more knowledge of life. So if they wanted to do something uh, or achieve something, then sometimes I could help them with some advice on how to do that. But basically I think it was just this acceptance of them as people, this willingness to listen. And it turns out that most people really want to talk about themselves. They enjoy talking about themselves. And if they can get a captive audience, then that's a great, a great thing. And that's one of the things that a field researcher has to exchange, attention and interest in other people 
and uh, very few of us find opportunities to have people sit there and listen to us for hours on end. And that's something that a field researcher can offer. And most of us like to talk about ourselves, I guess. Uh, I think that, um, that as it, when you go into other kinds of field situations, there are other kinds of exchanges. For example, I do a lot of work in consulting with businesses and with government departments. And one of the interesting things that I find is that if I want to do some research and I go hat in hand to a uh, senior manager and say, I want to do some research, he'll put his hand on his heart and say, well, I'm, of course, we're interested in knowledge, the advancement of knowledge and so on. Yes, we might grudgingly help you, but we'll limit your access to this data and we won't give you this information and, uh, and so on and so forth. Because I'm not really exchanging anything very much. I have nothing to offer. In fact, I'm asking for something and giving nothing very much in return, except some, maybe the prestige of being associated with the university, but that's fairly marginal and it's usually not very public. Uh, on the other hand, if I go as a consultant, uh, and uh, very often, for example, the firm will approach me and say, we have this problem, will you help us solve it? And they are in fact paying me. Uh, I am exchanging expertise in solving their problems, or helping them solve their problems. Uh, in, and, and for that, they will give me all kinds of information. They'll, give, they'll bring me information, I don't even have to ask for it. They'll beg me to go and look at a certain site. Uh, to go and interview people, to run a survey, and so on. Uh, so the, the situation changes dramatically. What I do have to be able to produce, however, is some relevant uh, skills in terms of helping them sort out what their problem is and come up with solutions themselves, or to be able to um, provide some alternatives or some skills or some information that is critical to, the, to them, to the solution of their problem from myself. Usually it's a combination of those two things. Although on the whole, my philosophy would be to try and get them to solve their own problems themselves. So the kinds of I see myself offering the skills that allow them to that allow them to catalyse the situation, come up with some options, and then make judgments about how those options might be pursued. Now, of course, the more you get involved consulting-wise with the firm, the finer the line becomes between a, the objectiveness of what you can do as an observer and the goals that you have to fulfill for them. I think you were going to talk about that right. later on. Right. Maybe you right. want to continue Maybe on. Maybe I'll just sort of take that sort of issue up here. Uh, it seems to me that in social, the so, social scientists, when they're doing research, have a notion that somehow or other, a notion of objectivity, the objectivity of the social scientist. I think it's a lot of bullshit, frankly. Um, the, uh, none of us are objective. We are all interested, we all have special interests that we're pursuing as we go into a field situation. I think the important thing is not so much what interests we have or whether we have interests or not, because I think we always have interests of our own or they're interests of someone else's or we're being paid to produce some result. All of this biases our data. Every social scientist is in fact biased and subjective in terms of his analysis, uh, and the, you know, the initial set that he brings uh, to a situation. That may be a theoretical bias, for example. So. It seems to me the search for coming in objectively is a, is a search that's never, never going to be fulfilled. The important thing to me is to know the sources of your bias, to understand what, as far as possible, the kinds of biases one is bringing in, and to try and set, offset these biases in some way by uh, trying to get insights from various sources. And one of the things I think I've learned from field research is that you're not doing it yourself if you do it intelligently. I learned, for example, in studying adolescent peer groups, not just to use my own observations as a source of data, but to employ everybody I could in the peer group itself uh, as another set of eyes and hands, another set of observers. So, for example, I would not only go and observe what people were doing, but I'd ask other people what they'd observed in this group, the participants themselves. And I'd find that they observed very often different things to the things I observed, because they observed from a different point of view. I also asked them to keep diaries of wh whom they contacted and when they contacted them and why they contacted and who contacted them and for what reasons. So they became my research assistants, if you like, looking at their world through their own eyes and they had access to situations which no way I would have access to, to those situations. I couldn't sit in every one of their homes for two weeks consecutively, but I could ask them to do that and then take those diaries which each individual kept and check the diaries for accuracy against each other 
and then interview them subsequently if there were discrepancies and so on. Um, I could go to adult uh, club leaders, for example, who had access to many of the same settings and ask them how they saw the situation. I could go into the, into the kids' homes and talk to their parents and ask them how they saw those situations. So I learned early, I guess, to try and offset my particular biases by collecting the biases of every other interest group in that area. And this has come over, I think, into working as a consultant in, in industry. One of the first things that I do is try to locate the critical interest groups in any organisation that I'm studying, or any social setting that I'm studying. And then I try to make sure that I use the biases of those interest groups to do a kind of cross-cutting analysis of the organisation. It's rather, I think, like a surveyor trying to survey a, a terrain. He might do a magnificent uh, and very finely tuned um, survey from one particular vantage point, but that's no, no, nowhere near as good as getting three rough surveys from three different points and being able to triangulate on, on, on various points in, in, the, uh, in the environment. It seems to me social research at its, or field research at its best is like that. If you can use observation, direct observation, if you can use secondary observation by people in the groups, you can supplement that by interviewing, you can supplement that by the use of diaries, uh, surveys, questionnaires and so on. The more of those methods you, you get to look at the same basic set of data, even if those methods are rough, the more of those methods you have, the more likely you are to arrive at some understanding of what that camel looks like with the uh, or I should say elephant, I think the, the analogy is. Somebody will be holding its trunk, somebody will be holding its tail, somebody will be holding its legs, and you're able to put the elephant together uh, by getting the viewpoints of the various people who are standing around the elephant. Do you want to continue on with the, the chronology of the, the gang study? Or sure. How, how do you um, uh, just trying to think where I was there. Yes, I went into the study of adolescent groups trying to solve a problem, that is, how do these groups transform so effectively the social attitudes, the role behaviours and so on of teenagers? And this is, a, this is interesting in terms of using different kinds of methods because uh, one of the first things that I did was to either interview or give out a very brief questionnaire to, to, to the members of, the, of the, say, a club, uh, associated with a club, asking them who they saw as members of their group. And I collected that data, uh, and I put that to one side. And then I observed who um, seemed to hang around together and who seemed to talk to each other and interact with each other. Now, the reason I started in on the second road and started doing it more and more systematically is when I first got that questionnaire data, it didn't make any sense. I found what Coleman, in fact, discovered when he did a study of teenage groups in, uh, in school settings. He'd read the group adolescent literature too, and he found that there seemed to be a contradiction between the adolescent literature and what he got from his survey data. He found instead of nice little cliques, which is what all the adolescent literature talked about, he found chains of association. And they didn't seem, you, if you've got a clique, you would expect to find everybody in that clique choosing each other, or most people choosing each other, and that would give you a nice boundary around the group. When I asked people who was in their group, I got chains too, no groups. But when I observed teenagers interacting, I found groups, clear groups. And if I asked people in one group about who somebody else belonged to who wasn't in their group, they'd also talk about groups. They'd say, oh, you know, Joanne West has a group up there in that particular area. And, and they'd name, and there'd be a lot of correspondence, regardless of who I was talking to, in who they'd name as belonging to that group. But this didn't seem to fit with their data. So uh, with the data I'd gathered through questionnaire. Or if I asked an individual, which group do you belong to? it didn't seem to fit with the group he associated with. And I put that data away for quite some time. I thought, maybe there's something wrong here. They don't understand the question. That didn't seem to make any sense. They're lying. Uh, that didn't seem to make any sense. I had the feeling these kids were being very sincere. Finally, when I had a lot of data on the actual associations, the real associations that I could observe and were reported to me by others, then I came back to this other data and I tried to put together these choices with a map, a sort of social map I'd made of who associated with whom. And then suddenly it fell into place. What I had gained, uh, I began to realise from asking people which group they belonged, for, belonged to, was their reference group. And there was a shift, a strong shift, between the reference group and the membership group. 
And that shift was systematic in one direction, upwards. If you came into a local region, you found there were a group of small, a uh, cluster of small groups, which are called cliques, that as you got up into middle adolescence, those cliques joined together. They still re remained cliques, but they became a crowd, a much larger association of cliques, with maybe 30 or so young people in them. And each clique might have only five to 10, uh, averaging around you know, six or so teenagers. And then together, a number of these would make up a crowd. And then in older adolescents, they'd move, the cliques would start to break up again, but now they'd be heterosexual instead of unisexual as they were in the early stages of adolescence. You get boys' cliques and girls' cliques in the early stages. So it seemed as though the crowd was the key. In middle adolescence, somewhere around middle adolescence, these one-sex groups came together, started mixing with each other, and then changed composition. And if you asked people who was a member of their group, they would name some of the upper status members in their membership group, plus some of the lower status members, or, some of, or sometimes some of the leaders of the crowd group, or the next group up. In, in the hierarchy of these groups. So each locality had a hierarchy, a status hierarchy, roughly associated with chronological age, um, but really more associated with heterosexual advancement, if you like. That is, the more heterosexually mature an individual was, the higher he was up in, the, in that hierarchy. And heterosexual advancement, you know, is relative. I mean, that might be just at the lower age levels, it might be you know, he, he really, this kid is really ahead of his peers because he's able to run around chases the girls and puts snails down their backs or something like this. This is really advanced heterosexual behaviour at age 13. Uh, but at age 16, it might be dating and actually getting the stage of kissing and doing some of these other strange things that older adolescents get into. Uh, so this became, this, this apparent uh, discrepancy between what I observed and what, I was, what was reported to me by individuals about which group they belonged to. Came in, became in fact to be the clue to how the, the power of these adolescent groups. It turned out that in order to get into this whole process of socialization, you had to get admitted into one of these cliques. There was no other way in. You couldn't come in as an individual, you could only come in through a clique. Getting into one of these cliques was an achievement type thing. You had to fight to get in, everybody talked about that process. They were very tight, very exclusive and very norm controlled. That is, they had clear ideas about what you did or what you didn't do, and you had to conform to those things to be accepted. Once you were accepted there, the most advanced boy or girl in that clique was the group leader. And you identified very strongly with that group leader. That group leader associated with members of the next crowd up uh, and identified with them. And it was this upward identification process which w gave the whole system its power. If I'm down here in the hierarchy, this age level, then I identify with my peer group leader. He identifies with the lower status members or the, or the leaders of the next crowd. They identify with the next crowd up and so on. So that each person is referring himself to, a, to people who are more mature heterosexually than he or she is. And this way there's a sort of um, a uh, set of hooks, if you like, going down in, through this hierarchy, pulling people up as they're getting older and getting more mature, they're learning new skills. The cost involved for the individuals of staying in those groups is to keep acquiring the next level of heterosexual skills. So uh, one can only find this out, in fact, by getting into a field situation. To get into a field situation, you had to establish some rapport with these groups and, and start to move with them and get these two kinds of evidence, the observational evidence and the interior um, psychological representation of that external reality that people carried around in their heads and in their hearts. And so to me, one of the lessons that I learn from that in doing field research even today is that there are two levels of reality. There is what the social scientist sees as the external reality, what he calls um, usually objective observation, although I don't believe it's fully objective, as I said. And there is the interior representation of that reality, which may be something very different again, which you can only get by in some way reaching inside of someone and having him tell you how he sees that world in some way. Now, you can do that through questionnaire, you can do it through surveys, you can do it through interviews, you can do it through just hanging around listening to what people say. 
And maybe you need to do it in two or three or all of those kinds of ways to get an accurate uh, representation of the internal constructs of the people in that situation. But you certainly need to get it from the key interest groups in whatever that situation is. Now, the, the methods for collecting data, let me just see if I get this straight, are accessible to both, both types of issues, the objective, as you say, and the more subjective, the interior. Uh, but it's, it's more difficult to get at the interior issues. Yes, I think um, um, as a social scientist, the, uh, the observational methods get it, generally get it, the more ex uh, the exterior reality, if you like. Mm -hmm. we, we can all see who interacts with whom, for example, if we hang around with a, uh, with a group out in the field. Although it may be more difficult to do that in between group meetings. I mean, in the case I was dealing with, one of my problems was how do I find out what kids are doing during the week when they're scattered around their homes? I can't be in all of those places at once. And I, I found the answer to that by getting the kids to become my observers for me and keep diaries. Um, so I couldn't observe that directly, so I used them as observers for me. But I used all of them as observers so that I could check, cross-check the accuracy of their observations. But to get to that interior psychological representation, it seems to be the most natural methods are interviewed, interview and simply listening to conversations uh, between people by just being around. And I think Street Corner Society, for example, gives a very good model uh, of how to do that, particularly the research um, methodological section at the back of that book. You had met, this is a, switching gears a little bit. Mm. When we first talked, you mentioned about quick and dirty methods of survey research and how uh, yeah. often you have to balance this, the need for practical feedback with less representative sampling techniques. Maybe yes. you want to talk yes. a little about that. Um, I think uh, along with this notion of using multi-methods to zero in on some data, I'd like to put the notion of um, using what I call quick and dirty methods to get quick results. I say, I use the term dirty because I, I, I'm using that in inverted commas uh, or in quotes uh, because I think many social scientists see these, strict social scientists see these meth kinds of methods as dirty. Uh, as social scientists I think we're trained to be very, very particular about uh, the kinds of methods that we use to be very particular about sampling approaches, um, the representation, uh, the representativeness of the, um, the kinds of samples we get, um, to spend a long time in questionnaire construction and so on. Um, my own feeling is that sometimes we have trade-offs that we have to do between perfecting those kinds of uh, factors and some of the real exigencies of working in, in situations where you need to get feedback back in time or get data back and analysed in time for it to be useful and relevant. Even as a social scientist, I think, doing studies, uh, quite often you, if you spend more than six months doing a study, uh, the data that you're, you're getting back is not useful for you from the point of view of your own research. But particularly if you're doing consulting with groups or action research, those groups want data and they want hot data. They don't it's no use going to a management group that wants to know about morale in their organisation, for example, and saying, yes, I'm going to run you the perfect survey. It's going to take us six months to write the questionnaire. It's going to take uh, me another six months to administer uh, it and do the pilot studies and so on. Uh, and it's going to take me another three or four months or six months to analyse it. And I'm not exaggerating. I know of many cases where social scientists, or they usually give a, small, a shorter term in which they're going to do that, in fact take 18 months to plan, carry out and, and analyse the results of a survey, uh, uh, an organisation-wide survey. My experience of that is that by the time that survey has been completed, management thinks it's a big yawn and they just throw it into the, their, their filing cabinet and forget it because 18 months later that data is useless to a manager who wants to make decisions. So uh, uh, one of the things that I've been working with is, is methods that are reliable enough to give us data that is relevant, um, uh, is, a, is a pretty good approximation of the reality out there, and yet is, uh, is gained quickly enough for it to be relevant to actual decisions which have to be made in a pragmatic fashion. And you've developed actual methods? 
Uh, yes, the kinds the kinds of methods. Uh, I mean, I think, for example, of a survey I did for a large international, the Australian subsidiary of a large international corporation. Uh, the executive group wanted to consider its future strategies for the next ten years. In order to do that, they wanted uh, an audit, if you like, of the current state of their organisation and where people within the organisation at all levels felt the organisation might be going. What were the critical problems that the organisation faced in the next 10 years and what uh, aspects of the organisational life needed some real attention because of this. Now they didn't want this data in uh, six months time, they didn't want it in 12 months time, they wanted it in two months time because that was when they needed the data to do their forward planning. And so in fact it, was, it proved to be possible to plan that piece of research to do a sample uh, set of interviews and questionnaire, questionnaire kind of combined interview questionnaire approach through the whole organisation, very large organisation, Australia wide, and Australia is as large as the continental United States, um, and to get those results in and analyse them all within two months. Now, most survey researchers would balk at the prospect of doing something like that. How did we do it? Um, we simply picked up an existing morale questionnaire or organisational survey questionnaire which had been two, used two years before in the organisation, which had taken a long time to do. Uh, we picked out key questions that had been used um, and which had seemed to be significant that had come out of that survey. This allowed us to, to make up a short questionnaire very quickly, which had already in a sense been pilot tested. We then also devised a um, um, set of pilot interview questions that could go along with that. And as interviewers, we, went, we took a number of uh, managers who had retired early, age in, the, in their 50s, who knew the organisation but were no longer part of the power structure, and we used about six of them. And we, in two days, I trained them to go out and do these interviews and administer these questionnaires. They knew the organisation thoroughly. They helped me choose an appropriate sample, uh, which was a kind of stratified, random sample but over representing some of the critical interest groups in the organisation. If you have, for example, as in you have in this industry, a dozen people in one area of the organisation who can stop that organisation dead in its tracks by going on strike, you're wise to see that they're represented in your sample, although their numbers might not be particularly significant, because politically they're significant. And it seems to me that raises sampling issues that most social scientists don't look at. Um, Maybe I, I want yeah. to press you on that sam sampling this power structure issue right. a bit. Maybe you want to talk about sure. that. Sure. Um, let me talk a little about sampling the power structure. Most social scientists, when they go into an organisation to do a survey, don't sample the power structure. They get um, an analysis of the employee, number of employees in the organisation. They ask what categories they're in um, by age, um, by skill level and so on, by status in the organisation, formal status but they very seldom ask for a representation of the political structure, if you like, of the organisation, the power structure of the organisation. Uh, <clears throat> from my point of view, I think one of the most important things we're doing in organisational change, and that's usually what managers are about, is we are making uh, some kind of impact on a power structure. And if we're going to study a power structure, then we have to sample the power structure. And you might have a group of 12 people or of eight people in an organisation of thousands who are in a critical situation. If it's an oil company, for example, uh, those people who connect up the oil pipes and offshore oil rigs, uh, there may be a relatively small number of them, but if they don't connect those oil pipes, uh, then the oil doesn't flow and that organisation doesn't operate. So you need to have, make sure that they are represented and that their views are represented in terms of any kind of survey. So one of the things that I do is to move around the organisation, interviewing people at various levels, asking them about the power structure. And they tell me about the formal power structure, and they tell me about the informal power structure, and they tell me about the industrial relations power structure. Uh, and out of that I try to create uh, some kind of power map of the organisation. Then I sit down with people who know the organisation well. Again, I like to get uh, a group that doesn't just represent the management group. And I ask them, now what sort of 
numbers, if we're going to take a, a sample of 100 or 150 for interview, how, how do you think we should sample from this group? And out of that, we come up with a new sampling design that is a sample that represents the relative power of those, ver those groups. Now, uh, I don't know social science, I've never seen social scientists sample in that way before, but it seems to make a lot of sense to managers in organisations and union representatives and others within organisations. That's good. You uh, had used the term action research a couple of yes. times. Maybe you could define that as yeah. you see what action research is. Uh, action research, as I see it, is sort of research on the run. It's research designed uh, for, it can be designed for social science purposes and it can be designed for, for the purposes of managers or others who want to change organisations. Um, and sometimes it's designed for both. In other words, I as a social researcher might be interested in understanding characteristics of, certain, of um, uh, large scale uh, organisations which have highly sophisticated technology. I'm not interested in, in studying uh, those organisations and doing a study that's going to last three years because in fact if we look at the introduction of new office technologies, I want to know how those, those technologies are being introduced now, the problems that are being faced now, uh, the kinds of human, human problems that emerge as a result of those new technologies now. I don't want to know how this, in two years time, I want to know in six months time so that I can write articles soon enough for those people who are studying this field, making recommendations uh, about it, trying to understand it, to know in time enough to be able to influence the course of events. Similarly, managers who are introducing new technologies don't want to know um, what's happening, where the problems are occurring in, um, in two years' time. They want, to, they want to know where those problems are occurring now so that they can take action to try and overcome those problems, and they want to know that in a relatively short time perspective. So very often my interest as a social researcher and the interest of a manager as a practical man who has to deal with a real situation coincide. That's what I call action research. When we go in with a short time perspective, we want to know how that process is operating at this time and we want to, know, we want to be able to understand that quickly so we can intervene or we can tell others how that's operating before it changes. And one of the things that's happening in organisations now is that the rate of change is building up so fast that we don't have time to do long-term social science studies. If we take that sort of time, that situation has changed. It's no longer what it was, and the research that we did is no longer relevant. I experienced this once when I did some research on rapid growth organisations. I studied 100 organisations. I did the traditional kind of research, long-time perspective. It took me about 18 months to do it. By the time I'd finished getting, when I, by the time I got to the point where I could write up my data, it was a no economic growth situation. Nobody was interested in any longer. I wasn't interested in any longer in the problems of rapidly growing organisations. Everybody wanted to know about organisational attrition and how we organise for that. <laughs> the, that's related to the ideas you're talking about are related to this exchange idea, in that uh, this whole thing tied up getting feedback, which is something that many people haven't talked about. A lot of people talked about intensive observation mm. that you talk about with your your work with delinquent gangs, and yet mm. the feedback idea is very interesting. Can I pursue that one a bit? Sure. Right. I'd like to pursue the notion of feedback in action research. Let me give you an example from real, real life. Um, I was brought in to work with uh, a group of managers who are planning a, a large-scale resource development project in Western Australia. This was a new mine. There was nothing there but desert. There were only six managers right at the very beginning of this project. They had to design a new town. They had to design a, a new organisation to get this particular uh, or out of the ground and to process it. And I was brought in to work with them on the human resource aspects. And that meant all sorts of things about how, you know, how, what sort of workforce should we have. Um, <clears throat> it led us into uh, the business of, um, well, you know, when, when I asked, for example, what sort of workforce do you want to have, they said, we want to have a stable workforce. And I said, does that mean married people? And they said, yes, we want, we want to have couples, not necessarily married, but couples. That'll give us more stability, we believe. So then I was led to ask, OK, where are the jobs for women? Now, there are traditional Australian mining managers, and they put they their hands in horror and said, my God, jobs for women. We don't give women jobs in mines. And that led us into a whole discussion of values and so on. And we ended up with jobs for women, offering, hiring couples in dual career programs and so on. 
Now, uh, when we designed the town, working with architects, town planners and so on, and we designed the organisation, and we in fact began to get construction on site, we got a f the first few houses, we, we had a shaft dug for the mine. So we had an elementary organisation and we had an elementary town community. Only a few people at this stage. I then came in to actually go through and interview people. As they, as they had moved into the houses, we had designed these houses. We designed living quarters for single people. Uh, we designed them according to certain principles. I then went and asked the first people who were able to test these how they found them. Did they find them satisfactory? Where did they fall short of their expectations? What other things could be done? And I did the same thing for the organisation as it began to develop and at various cr critical stages of its development. For example, as we moved from, began to look forward to moving from the construction phase of the organisation into the production phase, I was brought in to ask people what problems they anticipated and then to work with them to try and eliminate those problems as we moved across into that phase. In other words, I was providing an important feedback loop to management and to all of the planners who were working with management, including myself, on how effective the plans were. And that feedback loop, loop turned out to be absolutely vital because some of the policies that we developed in practice didn't work out. But we were able to pick up the bugs in the, in the policies or in the implementation of those policies early enough to be able to modify the implementation or modify the policies in time for, to stop those problems becoming large problems. And I believe that that feedback cycle is extremely important. Now, as a result of that, I've changed my model of social, social research. The old model was you make a pilot study and then you go and do a massive one-off piece of research. I'm a strong believer now in doing progressive studies uh, with, uh, which ask some questions, go in and get some data, refine the questions, then ask another, the next set of questions with another smaller set of studies and then refine those questions even further, come into another set of studies and so on, which I think is a different model of social research. But it builds a feedback, a set of feedback loops in there, which I think is very important. Are there any other issues that you had written down that you want to talk about? I think well, I'd like to talk a little about the role of the field researcher. Um, there's a, an important question, I think, as a field researcher, as the, to once you've gained access to a situation, how do you define your role in relationship to those people who are in the group? I think one of the mistakes that's always made by early uh, young researchers or researchers who are new to field research is to over-identify with the group they're researching. And I think most field researchers have anecdotes of this, of this kind. For example, uh, I remember when I was m moving around with one of these uh, delinquent gang, in fact, their language uh, was uh, really very strong. Uh, they used a lot of four-letter words and this wasn't my normal vocabulary. Uh, but that was part of the culture of the group and so after a while I decided that uh, that was the way they talked maybe without very consciously thinking about it. I thought I might be accepted better if I started to use their language. And so one day I came out with a long string of profane words like the ones they were using and they looked at me and they were really shocked. And they were also very resentful and I didn't understand this at first. They told me I shouldn't talk like that. Um, and basically, I guess, as I listened to them, what they were saying to me was, you're being untrue to yourself, you're not being for real. And I think they were also saying to me, you're pretending to be one of us, and you're not one of us, and keep that in mind. You're a guest in our group. And I realised that as I moved into a group, one of the resources I had to exchange for them was to be a representative of some outside reality that they could test their ideas against. As, the more I identified with the group, the more I became one of them, the less I had to offer in that regard. And I think many, many field researchers, in my experience, have stories to tell like that. In this exchange that goes on, um, it seems to me quite often they'll try and strike a hard bargain and they'll test you. I, I had one experience, for example, where I had the same delinquent group in my home. Unknown to me, I'd driven them over in my car, but they brought a whole bag full of uh, beer bottles with them, full beer bottles and uh, which they proceeded to, uh, to bring out in my flat. Now already the neighbours, I had about 15 of them and they were a pretty rough group. They'd also br brought a couple of the group moles along with them and the neighbours were already threatening to call the police because they kept taking these young girls down into the garden uh, in their terms for a quickie. Uh, and the neighbours didn't appreciate this sort of uh, 
exhibitionistic performance in the back backyard of the block of apartments I lived in. So I was a bit concerned about this, and I was also concerned as this gang would uh, sometimes, when they got heavy, heavily into the, into the liquor, uh, they get very violent. And I didn't particularly want that to happen in my, my apartment. They'd already torn one youth club apart. So I was, I was a bit upset about this, um, and I tried to persuade them not to drink this. They, uh, the leader of the group um, proceeded to open one of these bottles, despite my attempt to stop him. And I realised that this was a test and that I had to do something very quickly. And so I decided to take a risk. And it was a very scary moment, actually, because they were carrying knives and other things. And I jumped the, the leader of the group and took the bottle away from him. I, the, the thing that was scary was I didn't know where, which way the rest of the group were going to go. I had a struggle with the leader. Only one person came to his aid, and I was able to kick him swiftly in a painful place. Uh, but it was a real, a real fight. I realised afterwards that they were aware of the fact that they were guests in my home, and in a sense they had some sensitivity to that. And they were just testing me. But it was a rough scene for a moment. Subsequently, we were able to work out uh, an arrangement whereby they had some liquor, and um, I did a, a deal with them. They had something to drink, but they didn't get drunk. Now, I think most, again, most field researchers will tell some sort of story like that where the group will test you for how far you can go. And that doesn't matter whether you're doing field research in an organisation, a company, or whatever. They will test how far they can push you. And they'll also test whether, in fact, you treat their information as confidential and so on. So one has to work out as a field researcher a whole set of norms about how you're going to behave. You have to make sure that you understand your role and you work that role out as you go but you don't allow yourself to be manipulated because you'll only be respected as you respect yourself, as you place value on what you have to offer them, as you act as a person with integrity. And that's true whether you're dealing with a delinquent gang, which may not seem to respect integrity, uh, but they have their notions of integrity too. And they expect you to be for real, and they'll be real with you if you're real with them. What about the issue of confidentiality? How do you handle that? The issue of confidentiality, I think, is an absolute... Uh, number one priority issue. Um, I handle it by saying, by making some con kind of contract with the group. If it's a management group, for example, then I'm and I'm going to be asked to give a report. I, I will interview people, or I get information from various sources from informants. But I make it quite clear that I will never reveal anything that will identify any particular informant. But however, I will make a su an overall summary of what people tell me, and I'm very careful to modify any information in such a way that no, no informant can be uh, traced and never to say anything to anybody in that organisation about anything that anyone else has told me on a one-to-one -one basis. And that's an absolute rule which must not be broken under any circumstances and people within that organisation will always test you to see whether you'll do that. And if you do it with one person, everybody in that organisation will know the next day that you're not to be trusted. So if you want that information, if you want access to that information, you have no alternative but to respect the integrity, the confidentiality of everybody in that organisation, no matter whether the top of the organisation or the bottom. And I think that's very relevant for, um, for consulting work because one of the things I make clear in my initial contract with a chief executive, if it's a chief executive that brings me in, uh, is that my contract, as I see it, is to the organisation as a whole it is not to him as an individual. That is, my responsibility is to that total organisation. I will not reveal anything to the chief executive even though he is signing the cheques. Uh, that is confidential to any particular individual. Nor will I represent his interests as against any other, the interests of any other interest group in the organisation, including unions, uh, blue-collar workers and so on. In other words, I see myself in some way as of most value to that organisation if I can reflect back to them the reality of their situation, the reality of the interests of the various interest groups within the organisation. The moment I identify with one particular subgroup or become a member of that organisation uh, in a psychological sense by using, say, the word we, meaning you and me together, then I'm losing my value to the organisation. In your field work with the gangs, for instance, how did you keep notes? Did you keep a diary yourself at the end of the day? or You didn't, certainly didn't use a tape recorder, I would think. Or... Uh, sometimes I did use a tape recorder, um, but always asking the group if they were happy for me to use that. Sometimes there were, sometimes there weren't. Uh, 
I'm amazed at how uh, a lot of people don't uh, mind how, being tape recorded. Um, what I did with the teenagers was uh, a lot of them, at that stage, tape recorders weren't so common, and a lot of them hadn't heard their voice on tape recorders. It was a new kind of toy. So I'd let them play with it and listen to their own voices, and as they become familiar with it, uh, then they were pretty happy to have it around, and they didn't bother about it. Uh, the situation is somewhat different now, but on the other hand, people are very used to having tape recorders. Um, I kept a, kept a diary. Um, I normally didn't make notes when I was wandering around, because that's a bit conspicuous and people become very attentive to what it is you're writing down. But I wasn't above uh, sort of wandering into the john somewhere and making a few notes uh, when nobody was looking, um, or finding an opportunity to slip over in a corner and just note one or two key things down, uh, like interaction patterns and so on, uh, that I could then amplify on. But mostly, after I was been with a group, then I'd go away and make some notes afterwards, and I still use that kind of practice when I'm doing field work in organisations. If I'm interviewing individuals, I have no hesitation in making notes on what they're telling me. And in fact, I find that that often uh, is a good listening device, that it, because I'm writing, that there's a pull there that pulls them into talking. So it's quite useful, in a sense, in, in, in sort of putting pressure on the, per, the, on the informant to give you information. It's, it's interesting to look at the traditional model of social research that we inherit, which says, uh, this is the sort of model we learn in, gra in graduate school, I guess. You have theory, and then you have hypotheses, and then you set up a pilot study to really test your method, and then you do your field research, which might be a survey, your main research, whatever, and then you get your results, and you write it up, and that comes back to your theory. Now, that's all very well as long as you really know what your hypotheses are, but it seems to me that mostly in social science, and certainly in a lot of field research, you don't have a clear theory. You don't have, certainly don't have clear hypotheses. You, you, what, one of the things you want to do is generate some interesting hypotheses. So it seems to me that you start out with theory or, that may be too dignified a word, a set of hunches uh, that relate perhaps to some theories. Maybe not one theory, maybe two or three theories. Uh, out of that, you then derive some ideas, um, Again, let's call them hypotheses, but that's, again, maybe too dignified a word. You then get into doing some field research, but this should be small scale. You then refine your hypotheses. And you generate some new hypotheses, so you've got new ones. And then you go into your field research and maybe you expand your field research. And you test them and refine them again and so on and so on. Now what you're doing here is be, uh, building in some feedback loops here so that you're feeding back here, you're feeding around and then feeding back to your theory again. You keep recycling. Now. Uh, it seems to me that this is a useful model not only for field researchers, but it's also a useful model for, uh, for consultants who are working with management. Who are s management is setting up policies, they're implementing those policies, they want to know whether those policies are succeeding before they get right down to the end of the road. Because if they fail, then the whole organisation has failed. So it's both a model for action research from the research point of view and from the point of view of consulting. I really enjoy field research. Um, the thing that fascinates me about it, it is, is, it is that it's live. I like to look at real situations rather than, I guess, artificial situations. I like to understand the real world the way it really is. And I like the, uh, if, in a funny kind of way, the difficulty of field research. It's challenging. It's, to me, much, a much more exciting and sensitive process than the kind of research that's done sitting in laboratories, uh, behind desks, and so on. It brings me into contact with a lot of people. Uh, I guess I'm curious, nosy if you like. I like to sort of wander around the world, uh, poking my way into a sort of odd corners, finding out how the world looks from this perspective, uh, blue collar worker on the line, or manager up here, or engineer over here. Um, and it's exciting also because it's concerned with, generally concerned with change in some kind of way. That's the kind of field research uh, 
I, I, I enjoy. So I like to get involved in research that matters, that's going to have some practical consequences, where I'm going to see some results in a fairly immediate sense for what I do. And maybe that's just a personality thing. I like, I'm the sort of person who likes fairly immediate feedback. I don't like to wait three years to see results.